Welcome to uh, Liberty Radio, Corey. We are very pleased to have you uh, riding along with us this evening on uh, what we lovingly refer to as the Underground Railroad of COVID land because even in independent media, there is uh, an underground beneath the underground. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. So how I did a lot of work on COVID. I did a lot of work on COVID. Actually, yeah. I solved all of COVID by July of 2020, and I made a four-hour video of it. It's on, it's on Odyssey. Oh, nice. I'll yeah, I named Ralph Merrick and the creation in, North, uh, in Chapel Hill and all that stuff. All, all within like three months. I swear to God, COVID was the dumbest conspiracy ever. It was so easy. I, 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 I mean, Kennedy took me like five fucking years. COVID took me like five minutes. It was ridiculous. Well, it was so obvious with the propaganda. So Right. Mm -hmm. But not only that, the manufacture of it. I mean, all you had to do was look at the couple reports by, uh, you know, Jean-Claude Perez that came out showing that the spike protein was made of HIV inserts. Um, and then all you had to do was really like, hmm, scratch my head. Who's the world expert on coronaviruses? Uh, Ralph Barrick. Oh, what does he do down there? Oh, he does gain a function in North Carolina. Hmm. And then we have the emails from Dr. Chi, which confirmed that they did the experiments in North Carolina. So, yep. yeah, w Wuhan and the, and the lab there is the Lee Harvey Oswald of COVID. <laughs> that's yeah, that's a good way to put it, because I do think that the BSL facility in Winnipeg ties into it as well. Because they, they were shipping all kinds of crazy shit all over the world. And I would not be surprised to find out that there were, was stuff coming from Chapel Hill going to Winnipeg and then being sent over to Wuhan. You know, or it's possible. the other really way as well. That. What I do know is that a lot of the nanolipid particle stuff was done in Canada. But I don't know like what companies did it. Uh, or any of that stuff. I didn't, it, I was like COVID popped up like mid Kennedy research. And so I really didn't want to spend too much time on it. Once I realized, oh, uh, this is, this is too easy. I mean, obviously it was Israel behind the whole fucking thing. <laughs> I mean, that was the easiest connection to make of all considering Ralph Barrick was funded by Beth Israel research hospital. I mean, not the most obvious connection in the world, but Jesus. Yeah. So. Well, it's, it's kind of right in your face. Oh yeah. And then all the policy and everything that was being done was they were, it was constantly being leaked that the initiatives were coming out of Israeli scientists and all it was, it was so obvious. This was their Petri dish. So the par for the course, like not even yeah. shocking at all. It's just how it is. Yeah. And it's been nothing but since as well. Mm -hmm. Like even, even all the way up to the 7th of October, uh, which is, is now a thing apparently just like 9-11. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I love what's yeah. happening with all the propaganda. I love it. I love the 40 beheaded babies because 40 beheaded babies is what gas chambers were. And so I hope people can now see in real time that the gas chamber stories were bunk and that, 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 that all that was is 40 beheaded babies of, the, of World War II. So. Well, I have a theory that people see as much as they want to see. And that no matter true. what you show them, they're never going to see anything beyond that. Correct. Um, so who knows, we, our numbers may be growing, you know, as far as the people who have the ability to see beyond the illusion uh, and try to live their lives regardless of it. They may be growing, they may not. We'll see. Going to be an interesting end to the 2020s, I think, if things continue at their current pace. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. What to, for the first time ever, I don't know what to expect. I really have no idea. I mean... We're in an existential crisis, if I've ever seen one. Uh, perhaps. Or maybe we're just supposed to view it that way. You know, that might even be another level. I don't give them that side. much credit. These, I don't give, I'm starting to like completely disavow, like they, these people are too fucking dumb to pull a double, triple whammy on us. I'm starting to like all lose confidence that they have even the fucking slightest inkling of how to pull off regular propaganda, much less get us to do double, triple whammy, you know, overt, over the top psyops on us, really. Their psyops are so stupid these fucking days, it's become so obvious. It's like, I just genuinely don't have faith in them that they have the intelligence to pull the shit off. Like well, people go, people think that they're like, you know, the double, triple whammy is what I call it. Like, and you know, when they get us to go along with stuff and I just don't, uh, I just don't believe that they have the the, comp, the competence to be able to do it. Not like they used to. Propaganda in this in, in the information age doesn't work like it did back in the '40s through the '60s. You know, so well, right? It's a, a completely different, more refined system than what it was at the time that the JFK assassination took place. Like they've had all of that time to to really 
crunch the numbers and figure out what works and what doesn't. Well, you know, I understand what you're saying, but if you go back and look at the original, look at the origins of American propaganda, you're looking at like uh, 1941, 1942, the OSS prior to the CIA, right? This is where the real study of propaganda exists entirely. Um, can you get into things like the doctrine regarding rumors? Oh my God, that is the blueprint. That is the, and it, it, they haven't changed it. Um, they can't change it. The mind only works, you know, in so many ways to absorb information. And they figured that out a long time ago. So they really can't alter the playbook that much. And so for me, like um, between 2015 and 2018, before I got into Kennedy, I spent three years studying nothing but propaganda and the Holocaust. And so when you really get a grip on propaganda and like the origins of propaganda and like the true psychological, like how it actually works in the mind and what it actually does and how it works between communities and stuff like that, like, it becomes obvious what's propaganda today. And it just taught me that they can't play, they can't change the playbook. But so what that tells me is that people just need to become familiar with what the playbook is, and then they'll recognize propaganda like that instantly. Well, and that's the only they, thing I can save us, but nobody to wants to change the playbook then. They're not going to be able to, they won't, they can't, I don't see how they can. The well, mind only absorbs information in certain fixed ways, you know? So I don't think there's really, and these people are fucking stupid. Like they're the inbred descendants of once fucking smart people. You know, like when you go back and you study real propaganda and how they did that shit back in the forties, yeah. that was a work of art. Those guys were like literal geniuses, guys like RH Knapp who designed the entire psych program for the OSS. That guy, you, everybody needs to read his, uh, his paper on uh, this. I forget was this, the study of rumor or how rumor impacts psychology or I forget what exactly what it's called, but that you read that and you're like, oh my God. And it makes you question everything you know, because you come to realize everything you know, you find out through rumor it starts out as rumor and then eventually it solidifies into something real or it doesn't. But the, 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 the thought of it, the rumor itself lingers forever. That's why the gas chamber stories are still ever present because the rumors lasted forever, right? The imprint they made, there's no evidence of gas chambers. There's never been evidence of gas chambers. There's no evidence of 6 million Jews getting killed. Period. No evidence at all. But yet the rumor that was started back then lingers to this very day because the rumor is more important to the mind than the facts. So, yeah, but I think we're kind of, we're going off on a tangent here and I apologize no, right. for that. That's, that's what we do here. That's perfectly fine. Our audience is used to it. They're, uh, they're, they're all grown adults <clears throat> and they can choose. I should get a lot of comments because my dog, my dog will spin in circles in the background for like 10 minutes. And I always get a lot of comments on that, but that's my dog, Cleo. Uh, she's going to be put down next month and I'm Aww. kind of messed up over it. Yeah. She's 15 years old and that's what she does. She like walks in circles and stuff. <laughs> so. Oh man. Mm -hmm. That's terrible. I had a, yeah. uh, a cat for, I want to say it was about 11 years uh, and it just got filled up with cancer ended up having mm. to put it down so I can, I can empathize with a, a long relationship with an animal, uh, yeah. you know, especially one that, that, uh, you have a connection with. seems like that was, that was my time to go through that. And then now everything I've had since has just been a fucking nightmare, uh, <laughs> but that's different. That is going off on a tangent. So let's go back to your research into the JFK assassination. What sure. was it, you know, 10 years ago or however long ago it was that, that made you decide, I want to look into this as deeply as I possibly can to uncover the answer to this damn thing for myself. So I got into history in 2015 and really became fascinated by history. I mean, to the point to, to, today, I just consider myself a historian. Like I do a bunch of different stuff, but like a historian is like what's where my heart is. And uh, I was fortunate enough to befriend someone way back when, Mr. Ryan Dawson. I don't know if you know Ryan Dawson oh, yeah. or not. Uh, him and I have been like pretty close friends for a long time now. Um, he inspired me to get my work started on the Holocaust back in 2015. And I studied that through 2018. And uh, I helped, uh, he and I made together a documentary. He calls the spinning squirrel. Uh, I call it the Holocaust, how psychological warfare shapes belief and culture. So um, then after that, we were just having a conversation one day and he, he was drunk and I wanted to know who the shooter on the grassy knoll was. 
And I said, and he doesn't give up answers unless he's drunk. <laughs> but if he's drunk, he'll talk. But he won't. He's like a typical historian. He holds on to everything. So he goes, you want me to tell you or do you want to figure it out for yourself? And I said, I want to figure it out for myself. He goes, okay, I'll give you a hint. And he gave me a couple of hints. And that was it. It was off to the races. And that's been my life for the last six years now. So, yeah, it's been been a hell of a ride. Um, I can say I cracked the assassination in three years. Oh, by wow. 20, quick. By 20, yeah. Um, it took me two years to kind of solidify some of the ideas, but I had pretty much the general outline done in three years. So uh, ultimately, Israel was behind the assassination. It was it was coordinated through a series of front companies, Permindex, which is a massive, unbelievably uh, shady corporation that was basically conducted no known business. They were it was kicked a out of CIA cutout, wasn't it? Uh, it was Mossad. It was started by George Mandel, George Mantello. He was a Hungarian Jew who worked for the Mossad. Um, but the funding for much of it came from Alan Dulles directly through the banks, Seligman and Schroeder. So Permindex, the board of directors contained Alan Dulles, James Angleton, Joe Bonanno, mobster, Mo Dallitz, mobster, Roy Cohn, Donald Trump's lawyer in the 80s. Right, mobster. Um, <laughs> mobster, yeah, mob lawyer, basically. Um, it had a, basically the remnants of the Nazis, a couple of those guys, a couple of guys from the Corsican mafia, a couple of guys from Israel. You know, it was a who's who of intelligence, mafioso. You know, it was it, it, it's the proof that the Mossad, the CIA, and the mafia work together. It is the absolute proof of that fact. Underneath that was a sub company called Central Mondial Commercial CMC. Uh, Michelle mm -hmm. Meta has done incredible work on CMC. I would say Michelle Meta is the world expert on CMC. Uh, you should definitely try to find a copy of his book. Um, and there's a documentary made of the book on uh, YouTube. Uh, Central Mondial Commercial. It was a uh, Italian front company that was actually run out of Montreal by a guy named Louis Bloomfield. Louis Bloomfield. Uh, not only direct associate of David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin, but he was a close associate of Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw mm. also sat on the board of directors of CMC and Permindex. Mm -hmm. Clay Shaw, uh, the head of the Trademark, to Trademark being another CIA slash Mossad front organization headed up by Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw had been a lifelong CIA agent. I don't care what he says. He said that he was with the CIA and advisory, you know, from like 47 to 56. Uh, it's completely false. He was a full-on CIA agent running operations, uh, uh, invasions of Cuba going back to 47, run out of Venice, Florida. Actually run out of the same airport the 9-11 hijackers were allegedly trained at. So weird, interesting connections down there. But you got the connection between David Ferry and Clay Shaw going back to 47. So these guys were lifelong CIA, uh, probably because they were blackmailed, at least in the beginning. They were all homosexuals, right? So... Mm -hmm. Uh, all these guys in New Orleans were homosexuals um, and they were all being blackmailed by somebody uh, into doing what they were doing. Right. So, but then you have this like filtration down through CMC and um, Clay Shaw and David Ferry to the New Orleans crew who are the most impactful because you have, uh, you have some other crews. You have the three tramps who are Cleveland mob uh, and you have, who else you got? You got Dave Yaris and Lenny Patrick sent from Chicago and Miami on the behalf of the Chicago outfit. Uh, those guys were up there on the knoll also. Uh, and so you've got a variety of people coming in, a variety of shooter teams, but they're all connected. The one, the one person who was the single link to every single shooter was David Ferry. Um, the Cleveland mob guys, you got, uh, you have basically Danny Green. Most people don't understand Danny Green. He was the Irishman, right? So they're like, oh, he wasn't a mobster. Well, that's false. Uh, he was working for the Cleveland mob uh, when he was the head of the Longshoreman Union back in 63 at the time of the assassination. Uh, he's also the tall tramp in Dealey Plaza. And the old tramp was Leo Masseri, who was his boss, basically, who worked under a guy named James Licavoli for the Cleveland mob, who worked under a guy named John Scalish. And John Scalish worked under um, um, Giancana, who was in Chicago. Like Cleveland was kind of like an outpost of the Chicago outfit. So Makes you sense. got all these different, you've got these, these like different teams coming in from each of the mob bosses, Traficante connected to the grassy knoll shooter, Jack Valente. Um, so that's basically the relationships there. The, the focus for me and for Oliver Stone in his film, JFK, and for a lot of researchers was David Ferry and the New Orleans crew because they were the most impactful and they were the dumbest. They left the most evidence. 
those freaking idiots left evidence everywhere. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, it's so obvious that David Ferry was one of the shooters on the knoll. And that becomes obvious when you look at the fact that David Ferry, you know, only owned one suit. It was a dark blue suit with a black hat with a felt band. Um, and he's captured in multiple pictures in Daily Plaza, right? Then I trace his actions all the way to Hammond, Louisiana after the assassination, which debunks his... And he had an alibi that he went ice skating and a whole bunch of stuff in Houston. I debunked all that alibi. Um, I traced him to Hammond, Louisiana, where he hid out after the assassination. And Jim Garrison knew he hid out after the assassination. So... Hmm. Um, yeah, so my work is very different from the orthodoxy of Kennedy work. Uh, I actually wanted real answers and I got them. Uh, whereas the most, uh, the vast majority of Kennedy researchers out there, um, they're stuck on nonsense, like fiction, like Kennedy wanted to get out of Vietnam and that's why they killed him and the CIA killed him. Right. All right. If you want right. to say the CIA killed him, give me some details. They can't, they don't, they can't ever give you any details. They can't ever tell you who pulled the trigger. And if you can't identify a single shooter, then you can't identify anything. Everything you do is speculation. If you're not, if you didn't identify the shooters, you nobody should have ever written a book called JFK Solved. And there's about a hundred of them that say that, mm -hmm. right? Well, so, it's big business. Uh, you know, there's there's business. a lot of people that want to say they were the ones that that figured it out. Right, right. And so, uh, but they didn't, uh, and it's unfortunate because we've been as a, as a society and as a community, we've been milked for a, a lot of money for a bunch of people who've never solved anything, and they keep pointing fingers in the wrong direction. If you're going to say the CIA killed Kennedy, you're going to need to tell me who the CIA works for. Because hmm. they don't work for America. I'll tell you that much. They work for the global Jewish establishment or the global banking cartel. You know, they don't do anything for us. You know, the 17 countries we've bombed since 9-11 had to do with Israel, not America in any way, shape or form. So um, it's par for the course that Israel killed Kennedy. Seriously, so, they've been they've been behind every horrific act on the planet since the turn of the century. <laughs> so what was yeah. what was Israel's motivation for Kennedy was going to end Israel as a nation. This is my conclusion. Kennedy hated them. He could have been considered an anti-Semite when he talked to the Israelis. He, he was famously disappointed because, quote, all they ever do is lie. And he knew it. He knew about Demona. He knew about Numek and the stolen material, you know, from uh from the Numec plant to, uh, which was sent to Demona, he knew about the 600 pounds of uranium they stole from us. Kennedy knew all this. Kennedy knew that they were building a bomb because Time Magazine reported it in 1960. The whole world knew, but they kept lying to him about it. You know, they wouldn't let inspectors in. None of this stuff. So in May of '63, there is an exchange of letters between Kennedy and Ben Gurion. It's come to be known as the Battle of Letters. It is the most important stuff surrounding the assassination period. You will find hundreds of pages of documents between 1960 and the assassination that have that are solely about Israel, Demona, and their nuclear program. And this gets completely ignored by every Kennedy researcher in the world. So uh, he was going to shut them down entirely. He was going to end all financial aid. And when you end financial aid to Israel, they will crumble because they don't do anything. They have, don't mm. have a GDP of anything of any worth. And the Arab nations would have smelt blood in the water and they would have invaded and we wouldn't have gone to help. And Kennedy wanted to end Israel as a nation, period. That's why they killed him. It was partially over Demona, but it was mostly over his wanting to cut funding over Demona, which was the straw that broke the camel's back. So. You have that angle, okay? You've got the Permindex angle. So you've got multiple, you have motive, you have means, and you have opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then you have, let's go back to the relationships at play here. So we're talking about the United States Mafia run by a Jew, Meyer Lansky. Right. And the relationship with Israel, who was run by, it was a bunch of Jews, right? And then you have the CIA, who's run by, Let's be real. I don't give a. I don't care if McCone was the CIA director. It was Alan Dulles who was running the show. Right. He was a diehard Zionist. All right. These relationships that were behind the assassination were diehard Zionists. If it wasn't for, um, if it wasn't for the relationship between Ben Gurion and Meyer Lansky, they might not even be in Israel. So a guy named Tibor Rosenbaum set up what's called the Bank of Credit International (BCI), not to be mistaken with BCCI, the Bank right. of Credit and Commerce International. The Bank de Crédit International was set up by Tibor Rosenbaum and the Bronfmans. Okay. Right. It was the bank that was primarily used by Israel in its early days for all of its international dealings. It also happens to be the bank that was set up specifically so Meyer Lansky could launder all of the drug money 
from all the fuck from all the heroin that was coming out of Saigon that he had his hands in because it was Menachem Begin and it was Meyer Lansky who set up the trafficking routes between Saigon and Venezuela. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, to me, the, it, it just, in, there's no aspect of the assassination that isn't Jewish, period. And that brings us to Jack Ruby. And everyone says Jack Ruby couldn't have been mobbed because he was Jewish. And those people are stupid. They don't understand the mob. They don't understand right. that Meyer Lansky took over the mob in 31 when he had uh, Lucky Luciano and Albert Anastasia and Lepke Buckalter on all these guys assassinate Sal Maranzano and Joe Masseria. Yeah. From 31 onwards, the mob was run by Jews. Most people think it was run by the quote unquote Italians. No, no, that's just the Hollywood version of the right. story. Right. That's the Godfather version, which was directly Correct. overseen by Jack Valenti. Correct. Who was the shooter on the knoll. Yeah, because we're all I am, supposed to believe the, the Italian mob mm -hmm. narrative. Right. And I am 100% convinced at this point that Jack Valenti was given Hollywood specifically so he could monitor the Kennedy propaganda after the assassination because he was the shooter. That would make sense. So, um, plus when you get into the relationships that he had before uh, the assassination, you could tell he was being groomed for some something. And when you look at his involvement in the assassination, not only did he send the letter, well, let me back up. He handled Kennedy's, uh, Jack Valenti handled JFK's um, campaign in 1960. It was his marketing that got Kennedy, well, Kennedy didn't really get elected. He stole the election. But yeah. yeah, for the most part, and the mob helped him. Yeah, totally. Stole three ballot boxes, and that's what put it over the top. That's like not even conspiracy or speculation. That's like absolutely factually yeah. true. Well, no, so, I have uh, I have an audio bite of Sammy the Bull Gravano mm -hmm. telling the story of the 1960 presidential election. Yeah, so it's wild. So you got Jack Valenti handling that presidential campaign. He had already handled Johnson stuff since '56. He was clearly a member of the CIA because I have a document that shows that. Um, they had sent a letter to the White House staff or C.D. Deloach, who was in the FBI, um, in regards to having to transfer Jack Valenti's payroll from a federal agency to the White House. There's no other federal agency that you can work for and still run a, a marketing and advertising shop down in Houston full time, right, where you're running presidential campaigns at the behest of the CIA, right? right. So Kennedy's campaign was handled by the CIA. Weird, huh? Really a little weird. weird. Yeah. So, um, but after that, I mean, uh, Jack Valenti was obviously some, he was put through some sort of test uh, because he sent the initial letter to get Kennedy to Texas. He hosted all of the events, him and his company hosted all of the events in Texas, the Albert Thomas dinner, all that stuff, all of the hotels and the bookings and all that stuff were all handled by Jack Valenti's firm. All of the press communications were handled by Jack Valenti's firm. On November 18th, Jack Valenti then releases the motorcade route, which is what they used to say that Oswald saw it. Therefore, he shot him from the book depository, right? Then I have Jack Valenti on the grassy knoll where the Secret Service car helped him escape where he's clearly visible on the side of the Secret Service car as they're heading to Parkland Hospital. Then I believe that Jack Valenti plants the, um, the initial bullet that will go on to become the magic bullet, but it wasn't originally a Carcana round. Originally, it was a uh, round from a 303, from an Enfield 303, which is exactly what Valenti used to shoot the president. And how do I know that? Because later that day, they arrested Buell Frazier and they took off him a Enfield 303 and a bunch of 303 ammo, which matches the ammo that Jack Valenti planted at the hospital. You see, the magic bullet, which we all know is like the bullet that is like perfectly <laughs> didn't hit nothing. It got shot into like cotton wadding or whatever right. the hell. Like never right. shot nothing. But managed to um, kill you, one person and wound another. Right. And make seven injuries and come out pristine. Yeah. yeah. So um, the actual bullet that was left at the hospital was not a Carcana round. It was a pointed tip three or three round. And we know this because of the statements of uh, Daryl Tomlinson and O.P. Wright, um, because they were the two guys who found the bullet. And so then um, there was a book written called Six Seconds in Dallas. Um, God, I forget the guy's name who wrote it. I should know this on some of those things I talk about all the time. Well, he goes down and he talks to these guys and they're like, well, tell us about the bullet. And he's like, well, that bullet that I've seen the pictures of, that wasn't it. It was this. And he had actually one on his desk because uh, OP Wright had one because he was a hunter. Pulled one out. And he goes, this is exactly what the bullet looked like. It was a pointed tip 303 round. And so who that day got arrested with 303 ammo? Buell Frazier did. And it becomes obvious they were setting Buell Frazier up as a second patsy because Buell Frazier's name got dropped in a couple places, one of which being the Sports Drome rifle range, uh, which they believe that say that Oswald was, you know, firing 
at other people's targets and stuff. But Oswald never went to the, to the rifle range. Oswald never owned the Carcano rifle that they say he owned. The rifle itself was rejected by the post office. No one at the post office ever saw that rifle. Uh, the rifle also uh, was ordered with a forged money order. You see, money orders back in the day were written on hard card stock. But the thing that we're told is the money order that Oswald allegedly ordered that rifle with. It's all, all we have. We don't have the original money order ever. Never did. All we have is a photocopy of it. And that photocopy of it clearly shows there's ink bleed through, which means that it was forged on a regular piece of paper, not mm. cardstock. So he never ordered that rifle. Same thing with the handgun. The handgun, when you go and look into the handgun, it was rejected at the post office. It ended up at a place called Seaport Traders. And the man who picked it up signed for it the name Paxton, P-A-X-T-O-N. So there's no evidence Oswald ever ordered or maintained that or had that pistol. So we can't connect any of the handguns or their rifles or any of this stuff to Oswald. But we can connect uh, the man like Carcano's um, to David Ferry for sure. Um, he actually had one. A guy named Emilio Santana had one. But the actual Carcano itself came um, from a company called Adams Consolidated, which was run by a guy named Samuel Cummings. Samuel Cummings was a CIA agent who also was a guy who bought all the uh, all the weapons that were stolen out of the bunkers that David Ferry had stolen when he broke into the bunker at Homa. All the weapons that were supposed to go to the anti-Castro Cubans, they, and it actually ended up in the hands of the Israelis to fight the Palestinians, believe it or not. And we, uh, and so we have all these weird connections here on the on the Carcano rifle to a guy named, I'm sorry, through Adams Consolidated, right? And Samuel Cummings. And so Samuel Cummings becomes a, a, a key person in the import-export of arms all throughout this assassination and all the stuff in Cuba, but no one ever talks about that guy. Um, it's, we don't ever know that the rifle ever actually even made it to, um, clients right in Chicago. It doesn't even look like the rifle ever actually made it to clients. Uh, all that stuff in clients seems to have been faked after the fact. And so a lot of the physical paper trail that we have all seemingly was faked after the fact. And we don't have mm -hmm. any of the originals. All we have are like photocopies of stuff, which is like, makes no sense at all. Right. You think they would at least keep the originals in the, uh, in the archive, but they didn't. So, uh, but yes, back to Jack Valenti, Jack Valenti. Um, to me, uh, the proof in the pudding of Jack Valenti being the shooter on the knoll simply comes from the fact that when the secret service car pulls into Daly Plaza, there's 10 men on it, but two men exit Clint Hill gets up on the back of the president's car and you have Dave powers. Who's a friend of Kennedy who gets out because I think he knows what's coming. Everyone in that secret service car knew what was coming because at this point, there's only eight men left in that car. But by the time the secret service car gets past the triple underpass, as is depicted in McIntyre photo number two, the secret service car is back to having 10 men on it, hmm. which means they picked up two passengers. Those two passengers by sight alone are obviously Jack Valenti and David Morales, the legendary David Morales, who everyone's been trying to place and connect to the Kennedy assassination for 60 years. Clearly it's him in Dealey Plaza on the side of the secret service car. If you want, I got slides. I can show some slides if you want. Uh, I don't know if you're into that or not. Yeah. It doesn't matter can, to me either way. If you, you can figure out how to load them into this thing. Let me see. I do this all the time. It shouldn't take me that long. Um, let me see. <clears throat> yeah. Cause the fun part is right now uh, you can do media like even video, audio, whatever you want to do. I can't coach you through it because mm -hmm. I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, but I can't share shit with you. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah I should be able to. It shouldn't be an issue. Um, desktop. I just have so many folders. I'm trying to. For, I'm trying to remember where it's at. Here we go. I'm sorry. <clears throat> it's just one of the many features that I pay for uh, with Streamlabs. It's awesome. And hopefully, they're going to get that fixed real soon. Yeah, the picture that you sent for the thumbnail. Uh, yeah. It was interesting going through some of those names. Mm-hmm. Yep. So how All many right. how many shooters were there total from what what you've been able to to figure, or have you been able to? Yeah, totally. Um, I have in place nine people with rifles. Three of them I can't confirm if they pulled the trigger. So. That's where I'm at. Yeah, that's a hell of a triangulation. Yes. Um, yes, but if you know, if it's in an arc. It's not like a typical crossfire situation. It was done in an arc between the Daltex building, the book depository, and then 
um, the the grassy knoll overpass, right? So like a like a half crescent, right? Like a half a circle. Um, and I think they did that intentionally because they couldn't have they couldn't risk the people standing on the north side of Elm being hit. So, all right. So yeah, I got my notes up here. I should be able to screen share this no problem. All right. Can you see the screen? Uh, we sharing? will be able to in just a second. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, that should be up now. Okay. So this first picture here is the Secret Service car as it pulls into Dealey Plaza. There's 10 men on this car. Can you see the image that I'm showing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so there's, you can see eight of them here. Two of them are out of sight, Samuel Kinney and Emery Roberts. They're the driver and the guy in the front seat. But you have eight people here on the car and two driving. That's 10 people. Although you have two people get off, you have Dave Powers and Clint Hill. Clint Hill being a, who still goes around to this day, you know, saying he wished he could have done more. He was in on this just as much as anybody else. Him and Paul Landis, I got a major bone. If someone could get me in a room with Paul Landis, I will pick that guy a new one. Let me tell you, that guy is a straight liar. All these guys are liars and they've been lying for 60 years. And fortunately, some of them are still alive, but there's only eight men on this goddamn car at this point. So there should stay eight men all the way. Here you have the president's limo, Clint Hill's on the back. You have the lead car, which contains Decker, Curry, Wynn Lawson. Um, the, they're, they're breaking and they're moving over to allow the, the limousine to shoot past. Um, so here we get to McIntyre photo number one. McIntyre photo number one, you'll clearly see on the right side, you have the lead cards moved over. And it is allowing the the president's limo to shoot past. Although in the following sequence uh, of events, you'll see a number of different photographs. I don't have many of them here today, but you'll see that the lead car will once again be in front of the limo in future photographs, which means that the lead car and the limousine did this like weird game of leapfrog. They like mm. jumped around each other. Um, and when you zoom in on this photograph, you see a couple things here that jump out at me. Um, first of all, there's only one person on the side of the Secret Service car on the left. This person here with the number one over the head. The other number one, that's Glenn Bennett in the back seat. He's got the AR-15. He's completely irrelevant. But what we're talking about this person here on the left here, and this person clearly has a flat top, right? So Paul Landis, as we'll see as we go through the photographs, has a very rounded haircut. Um, and you have the other person who's Jack Reedy. Jack Reedy is the other Secret Service agent who's supposed to be on the front of the car. When you go through their statements, what you'll find is that Jack Reedy entered the Secret Service car in Dealey Plaza. That's what he says in his statement. And that's absolutely true. And he stays there, but he lies about where he goes. He says he goes into the front seat, but he doesn't. He goes into the second row of seats. And this is extremely important. And we'll, I'll point it out as we move on. But Paul Landis, in his statement, He's a guy who has a really rounded haircut and he's about six foot tall. Both of these guys are the same height, six foot tall. And I'll show this coming up. But Paul Landis, he claims that he stayed on the Secret Service car through the triple underpass, but he lied because this guy here's got a flat top. So um, this is that picture again. Let me, here we go. This is Paul Landis. Look at his haircut. It's extremely a rounded haircut. It's like, tight to his head. And yeah. this is Jack Reedy. Okay. Jack Reedy's got the receding hairline and shaggy, but look at these guys. They're both six foot tall and they're both the same height. And look how tall they are in comparison to the actual windshield itself. Like, look, this is a better one. Look at this. Look how much room there is between the windshield here and how tall they are. Look at where their shoulders are. This is two six foot tall plus guys who are white as a bone. Neither of them has a mustache nor a flat top. Right. But when you get to McIntyre photo number two, those aren't Reedy and Landis on the side of the car. Not even remotely close. These guys are short. Yeah. They're not even close to six foot tall. Well, and the one is taller than the other. Correct. Very, that's very much true. And that is the two guys who they picked up were Jack Valenti and David Morales. Clearly, David Morales has a flat top like he always does. And he's got his mustache. You can still see the mustache on the guy. And his little beard thing right here. That's David Morales. Yeah. And that's right. Jack Valente. That is not Jack Reedy. Jack Reedy is a solid six inches taller. You see, Dave Morales is five foot nine. And Jack Valente is five foot four. Holy hell. He was a midget. Midget. The dude's a midget. 
compare this to is these he guys still again. alive Look at that. Nah, he died a long time ago. Good. So, um, but look at this. I mean, look at these tall guys here. These tall white guys, right? Yeah. And then you get these with his mustache and flat top next to, and that's, I've been studying Jack Valenti for years. I've seen every picture there ever is of that guy. That's him. Um, Jack Reedy puts himself inside the secret service car in Dealey Plaza, which is evident by McIntyre photo number one where he's not on the secret service car anymore, right? See, look at that. Jack Reedy already hopped in and he's not going to hop back out again. No, that's David Morales, who they picked up in Dealey Plaza and they picked up Jack Valenti somewhere on the other side of the knoll. Now, if you look at the president's limousine, there's two people in the front seat. You have a this black circle here, this blackness here. That's Clint Hill's head as he's hanging over the side of the car as he's on top of Jackie in the back seat. So... There's another man standing in the back seat, back seat. And if you ask me, he's wearing a black jacket and a black hat. And he's holding something in his hands that goes out at a 45 degree angle like this. Hmm. Call me crazy. That looks like to me like a man standing in the back of the limousine holding a rifle. Call me crazy. You know, I can't think of another thing that is. We know that that person holding this is in front of the Secret Service car because you can clearly see the overlap here. Yeah. I mean, this is clearly in front of the Secret Service car. And look at his arm. It goes down here, cuts out this way. That guy's that's Jack Valenti. He's holding a rifle in the back seat of the president's limousine. This is all part of his initiation into whatever was to come. Hmm. All starting way back with his initiate his initial invitation to get Kennedy to Texas in the first place. Jack Valenti was there every step of the way. And then Jack Valenti will flee from Dallas on Air Force One in the photograph in the background of Lyndon Johnson being sworn in. So that's my work on Jack Valenti and the Knoll. I have actually, I've got hundreds of pages of slides of work I did on Jack Valenti's history. Like I spent literally two years studying that guy, his file and every word ever written about him. That guy is involved in so much more stuff than, than I even know. You so what was, what you need to do what is, was his eventual career arc? He spent 40 years as the lead propagandist in America for the MPAA where not only was he behind every single te television show and movie that you ever saw growing up as a kid had Jack Valenti's fingerprints on it, just like me. Every single television show, movie ever made that came out of Hollywood, Jack Valenti was the guy behind it. The head of the Motion Picture Association of America, who not only decided what rating your movie got and whether it got seen by or not, because ratings were a form of censorship. Right. That's what they did. Rating. If you had a movie with a certain rating, it didn't get in front of a certain audience. That was censorship. Jack Valenti was the original censorship industrial complex at the head of, as the head of the Motion Picture Association of America. So that was his lot in life. But I have a feeling he was. If you ask me, the circumstantial evidence that puts him as at the behind the trigger of the Martin Luther King assassination to me is overwhelming. So I mean, that's a whole other story. Um, really? Mm -hmm. Care to go Jack, into it? Well, I'll tell you this much. Raul was his brother-in-law up until 1961. Raul was a guy named Vincent Caltagirone Jr. who was right. uh, he was CIA and mafia, the whole package, you know, back in the day, yep. informant for the FBI, the typical trifecta. And um, yeah, he was married to Jack Valenti's sister until uh, 1961. Lorraine Valenti, who went on to become Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein, was married to Vincent Caltagirone Jr. until 61. And the FBI went out of their way to erase any trace of their marriage. You will not find any references to their marriage ever. The only place that you will find a connection is in their obituaries where they name their mutual children. Wow. That's it. There is one document in Jack Valenti's file where Jack Valenti's sister's name is redacted. It's listing out his family, has his mother, Giuseppe Valenti. I mean, father, Giuseppe Valenti, mother, uh, Josephine de George Valenti, sister, uh, Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein. And there's a line, her name is redacted, by the way, but he's only got one sister, so I know who it was. There's a line in the column drawn to her name and the name Vincent with an underline. That is the only document you'll ever find where there's ever even a hint that she's connected to anybody named Vincent. But then when you go through their obituaries, you'll find they have the same kids. Tom Caltagirone, who's married to a woman named Lou with a son named Jack. Both of them on both their obituaries. So it becomes obvious that Jack Valenti and Raul 
who was the man who set up Martin, who set up James Earl Ray in the Martin Luther King assassination. Mm -hmm. They were brother-in-laws till 61. And I put oh, Vincent Calter Grown Jr. as the short tramp in Dealey Plaza, which tells me he was probably Jack Valenti's spotter, which tells me he probably was still Jack Valenti's spotter when Martin Luther King got killed. And when Martin Luther King got killed, um, you won't find this anywhere except for a single newspaper article, I believe, out of Philadelphia the day after the assassination. You will find that a short, balding white man with uh, was was arrested outside of the boarding house in Memphis, sculled to a federal building, and no one's ever heard anything since. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm it probably wasn't Raul because if it was Raul, they would have left. They would have hung him. They would have let him out to you know. They would have hung him out to dry. Jack Valenti was protected. So, if you ask me, my my gut tells me that was Jack Valenti who got scuttled off to the federal building and protected because. God, I don't know. I don't know why some people get protected and others don't. He obviously went through all the, all the stuff. You know, he did all the things he was supposed to do. He was connected. I mean, going back to forty-eight with Henry Kissinger. That I mean, I think is really what got him deep. But really, what are know, what are Valenti's connections to Kissinger? Oh well, Kissinger was what who probably who got him into Harvard. You see, um, Jack Valenti got rejected from Harvard. He applied to their business school after getting out of the University of Texas in forty-six, and he gets rejected from Harvard. But what does he do? He gets on a plane and he flies up to meet the dean of the business school. And after spending a weekend with the guy, he's admitted into an honors program, an accelerated honors program that only like 1% of people who go to Harvard get into. <laughs> right? And who's in Harvard at that time, who I can definitely connect to Jack Valenti in the years later, like in the 70s, there's a whole dump of WikiLeaks files between communications between Kissinger and Jack Valenti talking about Peking in the seventies. Hmm. And he talks about, Oh, my long, my, my lifelong friend in this stuff. Right. So it was obviously Kissinger who got him into Harvard business school. And that's obviously we got him into his intelligence connections, but see, here's another thing. This is where I'm kind of messed up. He's a shooter, hundred percent. He's a shooter, but his world war two record, he was a bomber pilot. So I can't really square that circle. I've been trying Ryan hmm. Dawson can square that circle, but he won't give up the goods. So if you ever have Ryan on the show, you need to grill him on Jack Valenti, okay? Because he don't like okay. talking about it in public, and I'm putting him on. I'm putting him on blast here. So, well, I don't know if it's necessarily <laughs> blast. You know. Ryan Ryan knows more about Jack Valenti than I do currently um, in certain areas, at least his history. And so, but Ryan will never talk about it, like almost never publicly and very seldom privately. So, hmm. why do you think that is? Because historians are dicks. We don't like to give up the goods. <laughs> I mean, it's ours. I mean, once we found it, it's ours. And that's how he yeah. feels about it. So I can't blame him. Uh, I mean, Doug Valentine's even worse. God, Doug, Doug is <laughs> Doug Valentine has lied right to my face about knowing stuff. Right. J he identified Jack Valenti years ago, too. But when I brought up Jack Valenti, he pretended like he didn't know who he was. <laughs> I was like, Doug, come on, man. Quit bullshitting me. So, yeah, historians are, are, are really see. I just I'm not I'm open with the information because I believe we everyone needs to know. Because the only way we're ever going to change anything, nothing's ever going to change yeah. unless people realize what happened then. And like, you have to understand what happened then to understand what's going on now. Like, if you don't understand Kennedy, you can't understand what's going on today. Doesn't like, I would be bewildered if I didn't realize that Israel killed Kennedy to look at the world today and understand what's happening. This is a direct result. Everything going on in Palestine today is a direct result of killing Kennedy. Yeah. One 9 11 was a direct result. Yeah, of the assassination. Well, God, it's, it's all one operation. Yeah, it's all it's the same thing. You know, it's almost inseparable. The result is what we're seeing today. And it's disgusting to me. Repulsive. I hate what this nation's becoming. I mean, we, we're so entrenched with this cultural Marxism. These Jews are just destroying our world on purpose. It's fucking vile. You know, this is what they did to Germany between, you know, between 1918 and 1933. I, th God. I think. This is, again, a playbook. This is, is something that has been done over and over and over again. It, it mm -hmm. just gets refined over time as they understand uh, the, the human animal. And when yep. you push this button, you get that response. Yep. You know, it's, they've had this knowledge for a long, long time. And they've mm -hmm. kept it secret from us so that they can run these fucking mind games on us and you know, profit wildly in the process. Ultimately, I believe what's happening today is happening to not only destroy all semblance of, I'll call it,
for lack of a better term, white culture. So Jews can have a world of their own. They've openly written about this. Theodore Kaufman wrote about this in, in, you know, uh, Germany must perish. You got all kinds. This is like nothing shocking or new. Jews are trying to destroy America because we're the core of the cultural West. And once we destroy America, there will be no resistance left. And then they can finish their conquering of the world, which if you ask me, they, we, America ended November 22nd, period. They okay. took over our country and handed it off to Jews. So, I mean, it, it does seem like the, the whole event of the assassination, once you factor in like all the fucking Freemasonic symbology that's included in Dealey Plaza and was, mm -hmm. you know, years and years before anybody knew that there was going to be a president assassinated on that spot. Right. Well, every Freemason lodge going back to the dawn of the country was founded by a Jew. Yeah. It was a Jewish plot to rope the Goyim into their, into their conspiracy or whatever you want. I hate the word conspiracy. I almost never say that, but that's exactly what it is. Enterprise. It's, they have, Let's call right, it an enterprise. Have, enterprise. Yes. Just, just they like have, Poppy Bush did. They have come up with a million different ways to enroll people in their cause without letting them know that they've been enrolled into their cause. And the Freemasons yep. is a prime example of that. Yeah. All roads lead to Tel Aviv, at least in the modern era. <clears throat> I think it, it's got to be either Tel Aviv or City of London. Uh, or actually, you know, uh, for a long time, it was uh, like Davos in Switzerland, you know, because um, the, 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 going back to like the 50s and 60s, the Swiss Jews and this Jewish agency in Switzerland were the biggest prime movers. You know, mm. they were the prime movers in all kinds of things. Like, so like one good example of that is uh, Clay Shaw. Clay Shaw was in Dallas. Nobody can prove he was in Dallas, but he was in Dallas. He was there with a guy named Erwin Heyman, who was a member, a high ranking member of the Jewish agency in Switzerland. Right. So this cabal that killed Kennedy, that's taking over the world is really bigger than just Israel. It's bigger than just APAC. It's bigger than the Jewish agency. It's what I call the global Jewish establishment. I don't even know what else to call it. It incorporates all of these things. This is who the enemy is. It's not the average Jew on the street who doesn't know any better. Right. It's not. It's um it's a very it they're all it's it's a Zionist communist cabal, you know? I well, and know I think if mean. if they need to wear some other sort of mask twenty years down the road to hide their, their true purpose and identity, they'll they'll switch to, to something else at that point. Yeah. You I know, agree. it's it's mm -hmm. the I hate to say it, but it's the, the international Jew. Right. right. That Henry Correct. Ford wrote about and like that's right. been wiped from history. So so on my sub stack, I've spent the last couple months reading Mein Kampf. We've only got like two or three more shows left and we'll be we'll have completed Mein Kampf. And it is I man, let me tell you, it is not possible to understand how far we have fallen as a nation until you read Mein Kampf. Until you understand what really that what true concepts of nation and state are and how they're defenders of a culture, not destroyers of a culture. God, it's unbelievable what was happening to Germany before Hitler came to power. I mean, the overt Marxist destruction of Germany was well underway and it was clearly intentional and it was clearly an international plot. And it was mm -hmm. clearly between the, the communists and the Zionists. Like if ever there was a uh, conspiracy against Hitler, it was between the Zionists and communists. Like they're almost inseparable. They're, they're, those are the two Jewish ideologies that are destroying the world and they have to work together. And they did clearly um, pre in pre Hitler Germany, mostly in Munich. But when you really come to understand like that, what really makes a nation and what really makes a nation thrive and how the, the state is the embodiment of culture not the opposite. Like then you can only see how really how much of a shit fucking show this place is today. It's unreal. Everybody needs to read Mein Kampf. It's, it should be mandatory. So like what was going on in Germany back at that time? Well, you we look at places like Munich, uh, particularly, and, and Hitler focused much on Munich because he felt that Munich itself had been the epitome of all the height of human civilization of all time. And I can't say that he was wrong. I can't argue that at all. 
I mean, fine German engineering in the late 1800s and early 1900s was like world changing. Oh, yeah. you know, it, was, it was truly the best of the best of humanity had to offer. And so that was, so as he put it, and so as he interpreted, um, the Jew, the international Jew has no accomplishments of his own and can do nothing but destroy based on resentment and envy. And ultimately, the plot to destroy Germany um, really was being fostered by like the Frankfurt School, guys like Gromsky, um, mm -hmm. who were promoting communism and sexual deviancy. And then when you look at like the birth of like um, the transgender stuff, that all popped up in Munich and Germany and all around that time. And this was all being pushed by Jews. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, they'll people will argue over why this stuff was, oh, it's just freedom. Let people be themselves. No. No, no, no. I'm sorry. There are limitations that you need to have in place in order to have a functional society and pornography and prostitution and overall degeneracy and transgenderism was all being promoted and pushed. And it was working its way into the culture, into cinema and theater. And so Hitler gave, has given many speeches on the degradation of German culture and how nobody goes anymore. And nobody did. Nobody was participating. And it was in this really is era of Post World War One, Germany had been sliced and diced at the Treaty of Versailles, and he saw how, like, the reason that Germany was fractured was so in to intentionally separate brother from brother. Right? He saw mm -hmm. all of Germany and Austria, and even parts of Czechoslovakia, as all having been the a Germanic people who were the best in the world. Right? Um, so ra he saw racial, he saw the race and the nation as one thing. And he was right, right at the time because here in America, I mean, honest, let's be honest about America. There is zero possibility that you could ever link any of our blood to the land. Right. Not even the native Americans. Can you link their blood to the land? We don't even have a goddamn clue who, if there were ever native peoples here ever, you know? So the idea that national socialism could never work in America, but it could work in Germany. It could work in France. It could work in Europe. Hell, it could even work in parts of Asia. It could work in parts of Africa, mm -hmm. but it was based upon racial purity because racial purity meant, you know, that the, your neighbor and you had, a, had, had a similar background. You were alike, you had similar interests and you could be part of a community together right. and be proud of, of the, of the community that you were building. Right. You had a and common culture. You had a common culture and culture and Hitler saw culture and race and the state and the nation and all that as the, as one thing. It was all one thing. There was no separating race from the nation, from the individual. And everything that the individual did and all pride and accomplishments that they did went to better the totality of the race, the nation, the state, the whole nine yards, right? So even down to the janitor who mopped the floor, the janitor could be proud in doing what he was doing because he was doing it for the race and the culture and everything. And that's just how it was. You know, that was how it was. And that was what was lost post world war 1 that's well well he saw the the destruction of that going on before war with the infiltration of germany going on before world war 1 but really the treaty of versailles was the straw that broke the camel's back so mm. um now now i'm not saying everything that the nazis did was perfect it was flawed because you have to think um part of the ideology was racial purity but here's the thing that goes against human nature i think in general people might have hesitations on whether or not they want to race mix. But at the end of the day, guys are guys and they'll stick it wherever they fucking can stick it. And yep. that that totally basically um, contradicts the, it flies in the face of the ideology of national socialism, right? So um, that's, that's really the reason that national socialism could never really work on a large scale because it flies in the face of human nature. Really, mm -hmm. it does on, on a lot. Of, it requires a discipline that would, could be considered authoritarian. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but um, yeah, but when you look at what's going on today in America, um, find me a commercial that doesn't have an interracial couple in it oh, yeah. or a gay guy. Yeah. It's, this is all being thrown in our face on purpose to destroy mm -hmm. our morale. To, 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 to make sure that we never get together on any kind of cultural basis on a, on a foundational level. That's why they do this to us. Yeah. If you ask me, this is it's, treason and these people need to be tried and executed. This is I don't disagree. Disgusting. I, I think it's long uh, past time since the, the guillotine should have been out in the oh, street yes. in the fucking public square. Like that was two years ago, as far as I'm concerned. 
So we're long past that time at this point. Absolutely. The problem is we have painted ourselves into a corner of false pretense almost. Uh, And I say that in regards to violence. Like one thing that Hitler was adamant about was that every once in a while, people need to get their ass handed to them. But that doesn't fly in modern society, does it? No, No, not really. No, because modern society is you have to be safe and protected. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So, um, but uh, I agree. Every once in a while, people need to have their ass handed to them and shown that this is not correct and we won't stand for it. And honestly, there's certain ideologies. I don't really give a fuck about your free speech if you want to pre- preach communism or socialism or if you want to preach shit for like uh, minor attracted persons or anything that goes contrary to what our culture should fight for. Uh, I don't even, you shouldn't even have a platform. Like fuck communists and socialists and anybody who would do, who would preach any ideology, whether they understand it or not, that flies in the face of, uh, of our freedoms and our national heritage. Jesus Christ. I mean, there comes a point in time when you need to put up strict boundaries that you have to adhere to or else your society is going to crumble. And I think Western liberalism is shown to be a complete and total fucking failure. But I'm not a Republican either. Like, I don't vote at all. It's fucking pointless. I mean, if, they, if voting mattered, they wouldn't let you fucking do it. So it's just the whole right-left paradigm that we're currently in is ridiculous. The reality is when it boils down to it, there's only two worldviews period. All politics boils boils down to two worldviews, either Jewish communism and globalism or nationalism. That's it. There's no third option. Those are the two worldviews that everything boils down to. And one of those views is pushed by 3% of the world population. It's fucking disgusting. They shouldn't have a voice at all. So if it was up to me, I would strip Jews of every position of power in this country, businesses, government, you fucking name it. Being that much of a minority, you get that much representation, 3%, not 90%. Then like 75% of the government would be like, we'd have to get new uh, yep. scum fucks to put in there because yep. they'd be gone. And the same thing with the entertainment industry and yep. uh, everything, everything. Burn it. It all have to be burned to the ground and rebuilt from our culture. Again, un- I don't disagree with burning everything to the ground. I honestly, I think that's the rational solution mm-hmm. at this point because it's it's not that the system is infected with something that you can cut out of it. Like it's gone. Yeah, it's like ninety seven, ninety eight percent corrupt. You're not doing yourself any favors trying to save two percent of a corrupt system. You're just yep. not. Just fucking level the shit, be done with it, and start from scratch. Now, um, you know, never in my life had I been a real strict constitutionalist. I mean, I've always been fairly liberal, but liberalism had its limits, you know? Like, you want to smoke weed? That's okay. You want to be gay? Hey, go ahead. That's fine. Whatever. You know, there were normal limits to liberalism. But now it's like, if you're not a goddamn fucking tranny, you're fucking, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, should go off to fucking jail or something. I mean, it's unbelievable what's happening. And it's analogous to what happened in Germany post World War One. Absolutely. Like, so Absolutely. Everything going this on. Is, that's uh, why I'm our America. This is why I'm our America. 100%. Yeah. I mean, down to the specifics, <laughs> down to the like very specific. Like lately, the big talk this week is like Star Wars is all a bunch of lesbians, right? That's like the talk this week about Star Wars, right? Because the acolyte. This is straight out of the communist playbook. Yep. You know, take a, 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 a take a an extreme minority of people. And I don't buy that the 20 percent of people are gay these days. I don't fucking buy the numbers, period. OK, um, just because you got freaky in college once doesn't make you fucking gay. So uh, I, I don't want to hear these like 17 to 20 percent of Gen Z is gay. It's bullshit. Bullshit. It's, it's trendy. And that's why that's what it comes down to. So. But yeah, this is when you when you see what's going on today, and you realize this has happened. This is all part of the playbook, like we said. It's all cyclical, and um, you know it brings you back to the to the ultimate question, the Jewish question: How do you handle this in the modern era? Beats me. I have no idea. You don't. You can't handle it the way Hitler handled it. No, no. of course not, because it'll no. you'll just have the same result. 
yes, but I, I really kind of thank God for what's happening today with these uh, with the Palestinians and the propaganda we're seeing, like the forty beheaded babies thing. Like, I'm, to me, every time, every single day, more propaganda comes out of Israel, and it shines a light on the fact that none of the stuff that we've ever heard from history was real. The forty beheaded babies was gas chambers all day long, you know. And that this is this is probably the best that we can hope for in the modern era that people are going to get out of what's happening right now. If they come to understand how the propaganda works and how we've been lied to about everything whatever well, the subject that's, matter that's kind of my question about it is is this actually going to shake more people out of their slumber or is it is it just gonna because like i'm at the point now it's been going on for what eight nine months or something like i'm i'm so fucking sick in hearing about yeah. israel at this yeah. point I'm like, I just don't even, I, I might just avoid the news for a while because it's nothing but fucking Israel. Right. And so um, personally, I am all for that because it will eventually everyone will get to that point where everyone will realize that they are a terrorist state, that we were warned about these people a hundred years ago, um, and that uh, everything that has happened has been the biggest conspiracy in the world. Like Israel is the biggest conspiracy of all time. It genuinely is a real conspiracy. The fact that they even have a goddamn country, a bunch of fucking white inbred people claim to be from the Middle East can get a country there. Unreal. There's right. no bigger conspiracy that's ever fucking happened. So to me, I kind of love that Israel is the focus of attention because it's only a matter of time before everybody turns on them. And then when everybody turns on them, then they'll be like, huh, what was it that Hitler was saying about these people? And then they'll go back and they'll read Mein Kampf. And this is going to be the awakening moment that we need now. But I'm isn't, sorry, I'm isn't that exactly what Israel wants? Isn't that so. the fulfilling the prophecy? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I don't think so at all. We have to think that the Zionist modern day, we like it, it's really Benjamin Netanyahu. Like he's the biggest problem. Um, most of what has happened over the last, however long, I don't know if it would have happened in the manner it happened if it wasn't for him. I don't know if people like Benny Gantz or any of the, or any of the people who uh, would be I up against- I think you're probably yeah. right about that. I don't know if they would have done any of this stuff because Netanyahu is a straight up fucking lunatic cunt. Like really, yeah. like, he's the worst of the worst. He's he's the modern Menachem Begin. He doesn't give a fuck. Like he's been directly connected to so many things in American history. I mean, he, I mean, he was working for Arnold Milchan. He was part of the smuggling operation that that stole all the nuclear triggers from us, right? Like he is a fucking scumbag. He is the lowest of the low, and he has no problem. Car if if he if okay, it's not even beyond the pale that we'll see them straight up carpet bomb the 1.8 million people left in Gaza. He knows he's done politically. He's done. And when he gets out, he's going to go to jail for corruption. He's got nothing left. He, this is going to be his legacy. And to him, he's such a fucking lunatic that he, mm -hmm. I have no doubts that he would think that history would remember him fondly if he did that. So, but um, Israel never should have been. It's an abomination of a state. It's a state based on apartheid and all this, all the horrible things. Right, it's all uh, based on ultimate lies. conspiracy, all based on lies. And it wouldn't yeah. have even existed if it weren't for the heroin trade by Meyer Lansky, you know? So yeah, I'm not a fan mm -hmm. to say the least. I don't know. Like I say, I'm just, I'm getting tired of hearing about it at this point. I really am. I, I, I knew, I, I knew cause I was making my way back into the United States from Mexico when all of that shit went down back in October. And I just knew I was like, this is going to go on for fucking ever. Just like COVID, you know, they're going to beat people over the fucking head with it until they're sick of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's more people around the country and around the world that have the same viewpoint of it now that I do as well. And they're just like, just fucking make it stop. So what happens when, when they don't make it stop and they right. continue with their, their little greater Israel project. Mm -hmm. So at some point in time, I don't know when, but at some point in time, the BRICS nations are going to step in. They already announced that they're going to isolate and sanction Israel and not trade with them, which is massive. It's a huge deal, like huge deal. But at some point in time, I just don't see Russia not getting involved. I don't see Iran not getting involved. 
at some point in time, enough is going to be enough. And then Israel will be no more. When's that going to happen? I don't know, but I, it's, it's inevitable. I don't see how we cannot continue along this path and have a rogue nation, you know, especially calling shots in America. And once people start to see, once people start to realize the reason that we keep sending them arms and stuff and supporting this homicidal behavior is because it's all fucking Jews running our government. Then every, then, then that's when people will, will step up and, and revolt, hopefully. You know, I wonder if the people who are participating in the two-party illusion are actually getting the information about APAC in this particular selection cycle. It kind of seems like they are, because there's, there's a lot of that chatter in, in my Twitter feed. But, you know, then again, it's my Twitter feed, so it's probably all complete bullshit. Um, I, I just wonder if that information is actually reaching the voting public and they're internalizing it. I'm not sure that they are. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I have an answer either way. Uh. Um, eventually, I mean, this can't go on forever. That's obvious. What happens at the point in time that this can't go on forever when that moment comes I don't know. See, this is weird because like, this is the first year that I'm really kind of puzzled as to like, what the fuck's going on and what's going to happen, especially with all this Trump shit. I mean, the amount of, God, the amount of lawfare against Trump and what they're trying to do to Trump, like, are they, are, are they really going to let him be president? Are they really not going to steal this thing? Like, I don't have a fuck. That's if, if Biden wins this election. I mean, we got revolution in this country. I guarantee it. What that looks well, like in the modern have, era, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we may have an uprising in this country. Yeah, uh, if if we're subjected to four more years of shits and giggles, and I don't think most people even believe that that's Biden anymore. I mean, I think people are convinced that they might have gotten, they might have doubled them or something. I mean, who knows? But all I know is like I just don't have any confidence at all, and like I don't, nobody should be paying their taxes. Like they don't have a leg to stand on with taxes at all anymore. No, no, I not mean, at all. No representation, no taxation without representation. I can pr I can ba basically prove that we don't have representation anymore. Oh, it's that is easy. all corporate. But shit, Harvard proved it for us. Yeah, we don't have to do shit. We just go look. Peer reviewed study. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Best minds in the country said they ain't listening to you at all. But they're yep. still taking your money. Yep, that's a problem. That's a big fucking problem, and that's a problem that's got to be dealt with. I can't believe Trump floated the idea of getting rid of the income tax and replacing it with tariffs. I mean, that'd be great. It would, but I don't know. I mean, things would be more expensive, but everybody would have more money. So it'd be, it might be a kind of a trade-off, but I don't know how he could pull that off. If he could executive action that, if he could execute, you know, executive, whatever, you know, that'd be awesome. But I don't know. Well, I, I think the plan eventually, I mean, I know the plan eventually is to fold the United States into a union with Mexico and Canada so that it can be considered one block, right? Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to have economic parity between the nations, right? You can't have one that's like an economic superpower, even though Mexico will be assuming that role in the very near future. Uh, they, they have to be relatively close to one another. And you point out that people's trust in the system uh, really seems to be dwindling, which in my mind is kind of the situation that, that you would need to create, you know, keep people off balance, uh, keep people uncomfortable, keep people wondering where their next meal might be coming from, right? Once you get them into that position, they're going to be a little bit more compliant with whatever you might want to put on them. Like, I don't know, maybe like UN troops on American soil to help keep the peace because shit's just oh, getting out of control. I feel very strongly about that. The very split second we have foreign troops on American soil doing anything, that's open season target practice, if you ask Absolutely me. Absolutely it is. I think, I think that's what we're marching right towards. Not this year. But it before the end of the decade, yeah, I can see it playing out that way. Yeah, it's, it's disgusting what's happening, and because you know. it, it seems like what they're setting up in November is a situation where there are no wi no winners. Clearly, like nobody wins out of this situation. 
but damn near everybody's going to lose. And it's going to be another one of those things where they shove it in people's faces in order to get their blood pressure up and hopefully provoke them into violence. Because they already know that, you know, uh, frustration builds in the human psyche. And it eventually, at some point, builds to a point where it wants to get out. And it manifests in violence. So kind of, you know, back to what we've always been saying. Yeah. They know exactly <clears throat> which buttons they're pushing and and what outcome they're going to get from. You know, it's funny. I just had this conversation on the last show I did where we were talking about, like, are these people, like, smart enough? Like, these people seem so stupid and incompetent. Like, are they even smart enough to pull off anything And then I was reminded that like, yeah, they hire a bunch of dumb fucks and most people in running government are incompetent, but they still hire that two to 3% of like ultra geniuses who work for MIT and stuff like that, who end up going to work for the NSA and all that kind of stuff. So they still have some smart people in the mix, even though the vast majority of people seem incompetent. Well, you have to, you, the handlers have to uh, be a little bit above uh, the rest of the group. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't really work. Uh, before, yeah. before I let you go, Corey, uh, I saw a story this morning about uh, a New York Yankees fan who went to Yankee Stadium with a wad full of cash in his pocket and was greeted with a machine that said, you're going to have to deposit your cash here in order to like, you know, buy any refreshments or... <clears throat> Any souvenirs at the stadium? Oh, and by the way, we're going to charge you a three fifty service fee to convert your cash to this little uh, tokenized card that you can use throughout the stadium. And I know you recently had an experience similar to that. Oh yes, out in That's Colorado. Funny you that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was wondering if you might share that with us. Yeah, yeah. So I understand certain circumstances where. They don't take cash and uh, certain circumstances um, I can deal with. Like I'm going to go see fish at at a festival in like a month and a half and they renounce there's no cash. A situation like that, I understand. It's chaotic. There's all kinds of stuff going on and they're only there for a weekend. It's not a real permanent, it's not a permanent business. You know, there's a lot of reasons I can understand why they would do something like that. Prevent crime, robbery, whatever. But if you have a stable business, that has a business license in a state, you're always there, you're always servicing customers. And if you just randomly decide because it's an inconvenience for you to not take cash, that's disgustingly un-American. Like that is the most un-American thing you could ever do, especially when on our cash, it says this is good for all debts, public and private, right? So we have an amphitheater out here. It's the Mishawaka Amphitheater. It's a beautiful, amazing, great venue. It's like unbelievable. It's in the middle of the mountains. It's killer. They have a restaurant attached to it. They just changed their policy like within the past couple months. And so I get up there after camping for a couple of days and I see that and I'm like just disgusted. And so I get home and I look into the law and there's exceptions for the law. Just like you mentioned, you know, turn your cash into a prepaid card, you know? And so there's a law here in Colorado, the exemptions are the prepaid card thing like you just explained for Mm -hmm. the same reason. Um, But the business isn't doing that. What they're doing, and they totally are usurping the law, is that they are attempting to use gift cards instead of prepaid cards. And when you dig into prepaid cards, you need a special financial license to issue prepaid cards because they're refillable. It's like you have to have the ability to issue a Visa debit card, right? So that's the deal. The Raiders Stadium out in Las Vegas went cashless, and they Mm -hmm. have the same thing. But I'm sure they have some sort of mega license to handle money on a large scale like that. Right. Oh, yeah. But no, this, this business, um, that I went to that I want to be able to frequent again in the future, they are doing the buy my pen for $25 trick and I'll give you the mushrooms for free. Right. That's what they're doing because they're offering gift cards instead of prepaid debit cards, which is how you have to do it. So I have been in touch with the attorney general, the sheriff, the local district attorney. Like I've been in touch with a dozen people. I've sent 10 emails. Um, And unfortunately, these people are retaliating against me. They have actually taken my email address and phone number and signed me up on a dozen lists. I keep getting blown up my phone from these people. I know it's them because it's the only turbulence I have in my life right now. And these people are a bunch of amateurs. What a bunch um, of pussies. Yep. So I talked to the attorney general again today. 
Um, it's the second time I've talked to them. They're definitely interested in pursuing this case. I'm waiting on a packet from them to fill out um, and turn over emails and stuff to them. So, but yeah, this company is in pure violation of the law. And I had another friend of mine who was interested in pursuing um, action against another company in another state. And I had to advise them that there's no law there. There's a specific law in Colorado, but nationally there's no law against not taking cash. Did you really? know that? No, yep. there's no law not against not taking all. cash. Any business can refuse cash as per the federal reserve. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have to pass a specific law that makes you take cash. And fortunately we have one here in Colorado, uh, which is what I'm using to go after this company. So yeah, if you don't take cash, you're a communist and fuck you. That's how I look at it. It's that simple. If you don't take cash, go fuck yourself. You're a communist. So how do you think that is going to go over with the American people? I don't think they're going to care. I think they're apathetic. The wow. vast majority of people don't understand the implications. And most people are apathetic to it. Most people, honestly, I'm going to be honest. I use my debit card and my credit cards 90% of the time. The only time I use cash is if I go to the dispensary because they're not allowed to take they're not allowed to take debit cards or any of that stuff, right? Right. So I have to pay cash there. So, and I do it. Why? Because I'm fucking lazy and I'm guilty of that. End of story. I'm guilty. I'm lazy. I use my debit card when I shouldn't. I should be pulling cash out and using cash everywhere. And I don't. Um, the reason this offended me so much was because I didn't have a choice. They didn't give me an option. And I don't like when people don't give me options. This is America. It's the fucking land of options. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and so when you tell me I can't do something, that's when I get a problem with it. Even though normally I wouldn't have a problem with it out of my sheer laziness, which I'll totally admit. Right. But well, and that's, that's the thing is I think they're going to, again, have to mind trick Americans out of their cash, right? Yep. It's not going to be until after it's a done deal that most people are even going to realize, oh, wow, we don't have that currency anymore that we used mm -hmm. to have. And then after one generation, nobody will know any different. So it'll be all now, over. The only exception I'll make to my own rule with that is like, if a company doesn't take cash because they're taking Bitcoin instead and specifically only Bitcoin, that I would 100% get behind because that's a totally different story. That's, that's ditching the dollar for a real currency. That's not telling us we can't do something based on a currency that you're trying to destroy, right? Without giving us an alternative. So- right. Um, but yeah, I'm a big Bitcoin guy. I worked in the Bitcoin space for many years before I got into my Kennedy research. I mean, I was the personal assistant to Seyfedean Amos for two and a half years. He wrote the Bitcoin standard, um, so which is hailed as the Bible of Bitcoin. So, I mean, my, my connections to the Bitcoin community are very deep. And um, I actually have a, I'm going to mention this here today. I actually, have a, there's a crypto project I'm actually working on currently that we're going to be launching here very, very soon. So. Nice. For content, for content creators, believe it or not, specifically for us. So. Awesome. Well, remember you heard it here first on Liberty Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Now nah, we're gonna have we're gonna have some wrapped up in the next couple of months. I'm gonna be going on the road for about three weeks, and when I get back, we're gonna finalize everything. But yeah, we're in the process of building out the website, coming up with our plans, and ultimately, it's gonna be a specifically a coin designed to fund crypto pro not crypto to fund independent content creator projects. So awesome. Like if you were working on a movie, you'd be able to hit us up for funding and then we'll put it to a community vote whether you get it or not kind of thing. So that's what we're doing. Oh, that does sound really neat. Now I'm excited yeah. to, to hear the very different announcement. From any, very different from anything that's ever been before. So Awesome. Well, I'll be uh, looking forward uh, to hearing about that in the very near future. I'm guessing after the, the Third Eye Carnival, right? Yeah. After, uh, actually after that, I'm going on fish tour for like three and a half weeks. Okay. So, um, when I get back from that, it'll be in September sometime. We'll be finalizing everything. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for, uh, taking some of your time and spending it with us this evening, Corey. We certainly yeah, appreciate it. Uh, let the folks know where they can connect with your work and most importantly, where they can get your book about the JFK assassination. Sure. My book is on Amazon. It's called A Warning from History. It is the definitive book on the assassination. I name all the shooters, the three tramps. I go into everything. Um, it really is a, a culmination of like five years of my life. Um, it's... Uh, when I get back, I'm going to start another book. I'm actually, my second book, I've already outlined the chapters. It's 100% about how Israel killed Kennedy and the relationships that go back to 1945 and all that stuff that we talked about today. So um, that's the next book. And then um, after that, I'm going to, uh, I have to write a book on the Holocaust at some point because nobody has the balls to write one. So I guess I have to. 
Um, but uh, you can find me at uh, CoreyHughes.org. My podcast is called Corey Hughes Bloody History. But I'd really appreciate it if people would sign up for my Substack. It's five bucks a month, but it's the only show you're ever going to hear where I talk about Mein Kampf and the Holocaust and all that stuff. Nobody else is talking about it at all. So. And when do you normally do that show? Do you live day. stream it? No, no. Well, I do some live streaming. I'm starting to do because here's the deal. I hate these platforms we're forced to use. I despise all of them. They all screw us. They never have one. Mm-hmm. Rumble sent, pays out ten ten million dollar contracts, but they won't pay us the couple hundred bucks they owe us every month. They lie about our view numbers. They, I mean, Rumble is a shit show of a platform. And uh, so I do live streams a um, couple times a week. I just started really doing them, but I've been boycotting the video platforms and doing everything on audio. But my shows are daily. I do two daily shows. I do two one-hour daily shows plus a couple live streams a week plus day zero on Sundays. I do thirteen to fifteen shows a week. So, wow, I stay pretty fucking busy. It sounds like it. That sounds like a full schedule. No, Kennedy's I, my whole life. I, Kennedy, the assassination, and that era is my entire life. And since I can't live there in reality, I can live there in the documents. So there you go. That's what it's all about, then. No, I, I first encountered you uh, on day zero a little over a year ago. And I was like, wow, who is this angry guy? <laughs> I got to learn more about this dude. Uh, but yeah, after, uh, after getting to know you better over the course of the last year on day zero, as well as here this evening, uh, I can uh, firmly say that uh, anytime you want to come back on Liberty Radio, you got something new to promote, whatever, uh, hit us up. And, uh, and we'll bring you back on, no problem. I've now marked right. off two of the four horsemen. I've talked you see, to I, you I do, and um, I've talked to Charlie. So I think we go Lindsay next, and then Crown Jewel, of course, would be uh, X-Cube 420. Cube, I love Cube. He's like one of my favorite people in the fucking world. Dude, he's hilarious. We do a, sh- we do a podcast together that nobody listens to. We've been doing a podcast for like two and a half years together called Showtime with the Cube. It's a movie review show. And literally, we get like 10 listens. I'm not even fucking kidding. Wow. It's some of the best content out there. Nobody listens to it. I'm going to have uh, to check it out then. I've it's hilarious. You guys We're mentioned just, it a couple of times. We just have fun. We don't talk about, we try not to talk about politics, but then we get to watch these goddamn fucking movies that they're just woke politics out the ass. And then we're forced to talk about it. But no, it's just us watching movies and having a good time. So cool. Well, I'll check it out. Well, thanks again for, uh, for joining us this evening. And uh, you, at this point, you're free to go. All right, man. I hope you have a good night and thanks for having me on and we'll be in touch. Absolutely, man. Have a good one. You too. All right. That's it, ladies and gentlemen.